I'm Jarrett Murphy, and this is 112BK. Coming up, a lawyer for 2,500 9-11 survivors fighting for government-assisted funding for their health care. They are not getting their due. They didn't deserve to die. They didn't deserve to get cancer. Our federal government let them down by assuring us all the air was safe. And then the candidate for state senate challenging a Brooklyn incumbent who is a member of the much maligned IDC. The uh, accusation that I am the candidate of the gentrifiers is really an absurd one uh, because my opponent uh, has taken uh, so much money from the real estate industry. Hi, and welcome to the show. Coming up in studio, I'll talk with State Senate candidate Zellner Myrie about his challenge for the Brooklyn seat of incumbent and former independent Democratic conference member Jesse Hamilton. But first, because it's September 11th, we thought we'd check in about a group some would call the forgotten victims of 9-11. We're joined on the phone by attorney Michael Barish, who represents a group of 9-11 first responders and survivors, part of a ground zero cancer cluster, who are fighting to ensure they receive their health and disability pensions. Mr. Barish, thanks for taking the time today. Jared, thanks for having me. So tell us more. Who are these folks you are representing? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the survivors because they really are the forgotten. Uh, as you may recall, the EPA assured everybody, quote, the air is safe. They wanted everybody to pretend like nothing had happened. They wanted to reopen Wall Street. They wanted the kids to go back to school, to the residents to move back to their apartments to show that nothing can stop the resilient New Yorkers and Americans. Uh, and they told us the air was safe. They assured us that. But unfortunately, we now know it was not safe. Uh, as a matter of fact, they did an autopsy of my client, Detective James Ed Rogo, when he died of pulmonary fibrosis in 2006. And they found ground glass in his lungs, as well as asbestos, chromium, lead, benzene. These are all known carcinogens. So everybody in the 9-11 community, not just the firefighters and cops, but the students, the teachers, everybody, they were all exposed to the same toxins. And not surprisingly, they are developing rare cancers at an alarming rate. You mentioned Detective Zadroga. There is a federal law named after him. Uh, isn't there a federal program that's meant to help folks like that? Exactly. So, you know, I guess the government finally did the right thing. I'm glad to say it. The, after uh, misstating the truth about the quality of the air in 2006, when they saw the results of Detective uh, Zed Roga's autopsy, they were left with no choice but to create this Zed Roga Health and Compensation Act. And it opened the health program, which now gives free health care to the 9-11 community and compensation to everybody who has a certified physical illness. So is there uh, an issue facing your, your clients now, or is that program working as smoothly as you'd hoped? No, uh, the program is working great, but there are issues. The first one being the fact that so many people in the 9-11 community, especially the downtown residents and office workers who have since moved away from New York, they don't have a clue that the cancer that they were diagnosed with in 2008 or 2011 or 2015 is presumed to be caused by the toxic dust that they were exposed to. So they just don't know about this national health program. They just don't know about the compensation that they're entitled to. And that's why I'm so appreciative of journalists like you who are continuing to shine a light on this, because hopefully one of your listeners out there is going to call up a friend, a relative, someone that they know got sick or passed away, and they'll tell the family member, hey, look into this. Um, you don't have to hire my law firm, but you should learn about the health program. Learn about the victim compensation fund and take advantage of what the government is offering you. But that is our biggest challenge now, Jared. Is there, a, is there a time uh, sensitivity to this? Is there a deadline by which they have to get in, or, or is the money running yeah. out? Yes. So the two good questions. Number one, you have two years from the date of your certified illness to register with the Victim Compensation Fund in order to qualify for compensation. 
two years from the date of death for your family members to qualify. Um, and that two-year period is statutory, so you must do that. Um, and then the second big time thing that's on our, the ticking time bomb, as I call it, is the victim compensation fund expires at the end of 2020. We will be back in Washington next year lobbying to try to get Congress to do the right thing and extend it. But God knows if Congress will do the right thing. They're so dysfunctional down there now. I don't know how they'll agree to anything. But this, you know, con uh, cancer is extremely democratic. doesn't matter if you're a Democrat or a Republican. If you're old, young, white, black, Jewish, Christian, cancer doesn't discriminate. And it certainly has no deadline itself. So we have got to get this thing extended. Um, you know, I invite your uh, listeners, if you want to learn more about this, go to 911victimfund.com. There's so much information on this site about both the health program and the victim compensation fund. We describe this as a cancer cluster, and, and that term is thrown around a bit. What does that mean? How, how much greater is the risk in this population than would be in any group of Americans of, of getting some kind of cancer? Okay, well, of course, cancer it, it doesn't discriminate. All people in life get cancer eventually. Not all, but it's, it's everywhere. But the doctors have great statistical evidence from the fire department. They know that cancer is elevated between 19 and 32 percent, depending on the different types of cancer. Skin cancer being the most prevalent because the concrete dust that people were exposed to was so toxic. It, was, uh, it had the same pH level, by the way, as Drano. So you can in imagine inhaling it has affected the esophagus, the lungs. Um, prostate cancer is so elevated, breast cancer for women. Um, and as a matter of fact, we're now seeing breast cancer for men, which is so rare. But it's all based on statistics, and the World Trade Center Health Program has linked 68 cancers and a host of respiratory illnesses now to these toxins. Mr. Barish, you're talking to us from uh, near Ground Zero, where you're about to participate in a memorial ceremony. And I'm curious, beyond the money, beyond the health care, do you feel like people who have died since 9-11 of an illness triggered by these toxins, are they getting their due in terms of being considered part of the first responders who, uh, who were the victims of 9-11? Of are they considered part of that larger class of, uh, well, of people who died that day? Yeah, well, they are now part of the larger class because there's no distinction anymore between the responders and the survivors. The survivors are really office workers and residents, teachers and students. But they are not getting their due. They didn't deserve to die. They didn't deserve to get cancer. Our federal government let them down by assuring us all the air was safe. And it's one thing for first responders who are hired to do the job to run towards danger. You know, if they're getting sick now because they weren't given respiratory protection, it's horrible. But at least they accepted the risk. Certainly an eighth grade student, a 12th grade student at Stuyvesant High School, that person never was given a choice. They were told, go back to school. Everything's OK. And now a 28 year old woman with breast cancer. That's not right in anybody's imagination. Mr. Michael Barish, attorney for first responders and other people made ill by the events in Lower Manhattan 17 years ago today. Thanks so much for joining us. Coming up next, Zellner Myrie. Brooklyn is one of the bluest places in the United States. If you just took the active registered Democrats in Kings County, you'd have the 11th largest city in the U.S. Not surprisingly, not all those Democrats agree on everything. They even disagree on what it means to be a real Democrat. From 2011 through this past April, a group of Democrats in the New York State Senate broke away to form an independent conference that aligned with, with Republicans. One of them was Brooklyn Senator Jesse Hamilton, who joined that IDC in 2016. In Thursday's primary election, he faces a challenge largely because of that decision. We'd expected to have Mr. Hamilton on the show yesterday, but he had to drop out at the last minute. The man challenging him, Zellner Myrie, joins us today. Welcome to the show, Mr. Myrie. Thanks for having me. So you are into the last few hours, really, of the campaign. Tell us what that means. What are you, what are you up to? Yeah, it's a, it's a real point to be at. You know, you work a lot of months uh, to get up until this point. 
Uh, as you might imagine, I am exhausted, uh, but it is a good exhaustion. I feel like we have uh, done what we've needed to do. I have the uh, worn out souls um, to kind of show uh, the, the work that we've been doing and the door knocking. I um, mean, it really comes down to pulling out our voters at this point. Um, I feel good about where we're at in the campaign, and I am looking forward to Thursday night. Would you say that people you run into the district typically have heard about the race, or are you introducing them to the idea that there's an election on Thursday? Yeah, I think we have done a good job um, of really making sure that, one, folks know that the election is not being held today, um, and it's being held on Thursday. Uh, and I think over the past couple of weeks, as people have been returning from summer vacation, as school has started, uh, there's been a lot more focus on the election. So I was just at the trains this morning, and a lot of people are, you know, ready to vote on Thursday. They're excited. Um, and I think that it is, uh, it's going to be a good opportunity for us to come out and speak as one voice. Now, I know sometimes that conversation with the voter is a quick hi, don't forget to vote. But when you have another minute, what do folks talk about? Do they talk about the IDC? Do they bring up a particular issue? Kind of what's on voters' minds? The number one issue has been housing. Uh, you know, even just this morning, uh, someone pulled me off of the platform and said, look, I don't really care about anything you have to say other than what you're going to do about housing. Uh, in fact, I have a housing situation that I'm dealing with right now that I'd like your help with. And I think that that is reflective of what I've been hearing throughout the campaign. You know, the IDC, um, I think it obviously is a bad thing, and it showed a betrayal to Democrats in the community, uh, but a lot of it is insider baseball. A lot of it you don't have enough time to explain in that quick interaction. And so people have been concerned about the issues. Housing has been the number one. So talk about when a, when a voter comes to you with that, like a real kind of cri de corps, like I need help with housing. What can you tell them? Because even if you win the primary and the general, you'll be one of 63 senators. Who knows who controls that body? Who knows if the legislation you want to see passed will, will come to effect and if it will help this person. So what, what would your response be to someone who says that? I think what people are looking for in their leaders is someone that's going to fight. Not someone that's just going to make promises to deliver, but they really want to see fight. And so when I talk to people, I say, look, I grew up in a rent-stabilized apartment. Um, I've been a housing organizer. Uh, this is something that I'm very passionate about, uh, and I fought for it in the past, and you know, we were able to get the Tenant Bill of Rights passed, uh, but there have also been some failures. We don't get everything that we want, uh, but what I tell people is that you can count on me to be a fighter for, the, for those laws. I think in the next session, we have a unique opportunity because a lot of the affordable housing laws are up for renewal in June. Uh, and so when I tell people, look, this is an urgent election, who you send to Albany matters because next year a lot of the issues that affect you are up for renewal. One of the things in your platform is trying to revoke or repeal the ERSTAT law, which is something that has been mentioned for, for many years. Mm -hmm. What is that and what are the realistic prospects for that being overturned? So the ERSTAT law essentially gives control over New York City's housing laws to the state uh, legislature. And so what that means is uh, you have Republicans from upstate and out of the city having an over, um, uh, oversized influence over housing policy for folks in New York. Uh, the former chair of the Housing Committee uh, was a Republican who represented Lake Placid, um, and she was able to make policy or to stop policy uh, that affected folks right here in Brownsville or Crown Heights. And so uh, the Erdstadt law, I think, needs to be repealed because the truth is that the people closest to the ground, the people here in New York City, should be able to control our housing laws, and that's how it was up until the late 1970s. I think we have a realistic chance uh, to, to repeal the Erdstadt law uh, because we're going to get a Democratic majority and we're going to have a Democrat be the chair of the Housing Committee. Uh, you know, I think that we uh, have a good opportunity to, at the very least, have a discussion about it. Part of what's so insidious about having Republican control in a body that has more Democrats than Republicans is that issues that are important to Democrats don't even come up for discussion. Your candidacy has been grouped with others who are also challenging former members of the IDC and generally with kind of an insurgent wing of the party that includes everyone from Cynthia Nixon to the state Senate candidates to Jumani Williams. How do you feel about that? And do you s suspect that, that that wider movement will affect your prospects? Are you worried about stories about Julia Salazar or about Cynthia Nixon's bagel choices uh, affecting how you're going to perform on Thursday? No, I think that we've been doing the work right here in this district. We have, you know, we've maintained a laser-like focus on talking to the voters of the 20th State Senate District. Uh, so I honestly um, am not worried about what's going on outside as insofar as it affects 
what the turnout will be or how folks are going to be supportive of us. I think what we have seen, however, um, is that when um, a group of us win and we, we, we get to the state Senate, uh, we're going to be going in with a progressive mandate. And I think that business as usual uh, will not be usual anymore. Um, and we're going to be able to say, look, we ran on these progressive issues, and we expect for there to be some action on that. And so um, I think that it has been encouraging to see this. Uh, and I'm excited about the prospect of serving with some progressive colleagues. Just remind voters who are viewing, um, in terms of the statewide races, governor, attorney general, lieutenant governor, have you endorsed? We have not made any public endorsements uh, in, in those races and have remained very much focused on the 20th. And why not? Someone might say this is your first chance to take kind of a bold stand and tell us you know, what you believe in. Uh, I think, uh, honestly, the people who are looking to me and that will be supportive um, have really been focused on what am I going to do for Central Brooklyn. Um, I think that this opportunity to talk to the voters in the district, um, to really talk about what we're going to do for Central Brooklyn um, is why I ran, um, and I hope to, to, to keep that focus. Uh, the Climate Community Protection Act is something you mentioned in your platform. It's, uh, environmental issues haven't gotten a lot of airing in this election year, but they're pretty important. Why is that important to you? Yeah, so you know, when you look at uh, climate change and the fight against climate change, I think a lot of times uh, we have been left out of the conversation. When I mean we, um, I think uh, communities in central Brooklyn and communities of color, right? But there are a lot of environmental issues that have an outsized impact on us. I grew up with very bad asthma um, and very bad eczema. Uh, and these are things that are related to environmental issues. Uh, these are pollutants. These are too much. This is too much car pollution. Uh, this deals with um, some um, some maladies and how how your housing is constructed. Um, and so I think the CCPA is an opportunity within the CCPA. Um, there are um, carve outs for investments in communities that have been disproportionately affected uh, uh, by some of these environmental issues. And that's part of why I've been uh, such a strong proponent. Immigration issues that come up a lot on the federal level, and some candidates like you are talking about them locally, too. It's often said that the goal is to make New York into a true sanctuary state. But I often wonder, given that the feds do have power over immigration enforcement, they do have the authority to deport some people, can we really promise that to immigrants in New York, that, that it really is truly a sanctuary, that they can feel truly safe here, even if we do as much as we possibly can with local and state laws? You know, what I have been talking to folks about in my district um, is really, you know, the Liberty Act, which would give immigrants, um, uh, people in a deportation proceeding, a lawyer, right? And that doesn't necessarily mean uh, that New York is a sanctuary state, uh, but what it does provide is another layer of protection. And I think that's what folks are looking for in their local leaders, right? Even when there are times where we can't completely protect, um, we should be trying to protect as much as possible. And I think that the tools that we have as a state will allow us to do that. I also think that there are some explicit things that the state can do uh, administratively in our courthouses. I think that we can get rid of ICE agents in our courthouses, and that is, I think, within our constitutional power to do so. Um, and it's another piece of legislation that I think um, I'll be fighting for in the state Senate. Now, uh, money is obviously a, always a big part of politics, for better or worse. And City Limits had a story today about out-of-state donors and the state Senate races. And out-of-state donors aren't a huge part of your campaign, but 20% of your donors, maybe 10% of your money, not that much more than Senator Hamilton. But across the board, there's been a lot of out-of-state interest in a lot of these insurgent campaigns. To what do you attribute that? And is that a good thing for people from elsewhere to be having some impact on New York state politics? Yeah, I think that what it really reflects is that people understand that what happens in New York has an outsized impact over what happens in the entire nation. And if we have a progressive state legislature uh, here in New York and we're able to pass progressive legislation, I think there are other states uh, in the union that will say, we should be able to do this as well. And so I think that our message has resonated with folks all over, uh, all over the country. You know, as you mentioned, the, the majority of our money has come from uh, w within the confines of the city and, and, and the district. Um, and I think people are much more concerned with the insidious donations from the real estate lobby um, that can have an out, you know, that, that can really alter someone's uh, ability to be effective for tenants and homeowners. So gentrification is a big issue across the city and especially in Brooklyn, almost every neighborhood, the district you're running for, not an exception to that. Um, your opponent has said that you're a candidate of the gentrifiers. I'll have you respond to that. But talk about gentrification and its effects on the district. How does it change the job of being state senator for this district? And are there, are there pros and cons for folks in that area 
from the changes that we're seeing taking place. You know, I think the uh, accusation that I am the candidate of the gentrifiers is really an absurd one uh, because my opponent uh, has taken uh, so much money from the real estate industry. Uh, in fact, it has been his single biggest contributor, uh, and these are the same folks that are accelerating gentrification in our community. Um, housing has been something that I have been fighting for, not just right before this race, and not just during this race, uh, but right after I got out of college and worked for the city council. Um, and so I think that it is uh, really just an absurd uh, accusation, and it takes away from the real issue here. And that is that we have folks that have built this community, people like my mom, people like my neighbors, who have built this community, and their reward for that um, has been harassment um, or eviction because landlords feel like they can get um, some higher prices. So I think there are a couple of things that we can do to address gentrification. One of those things is trying to keep our folks in the community by having good rent regulation laws. Uh, but I also think that we have an opportunity to talk about the path from rent to home ownership. Um, I think using our public land, not just for big developments and big for-profit developers, but using them for things like community land trusts is also a way for us to have folks invested in this community and owning in the community because that makes it much, much more difficult to kick them out. Um, I think that we are not opposed to change, right, and I think gentrification does bring change. We are opposed to change at the expense of the people um, that have made the community attractive. And so um, I do think that I uh, have the ability to, uh, to not only fight for our tenants and fight for our homeowners, uh, but to really speak to the issue and not levy these accusations that take away from the substance. So you're a first-time candidate. Um, but many of the people who have been in Albany for decades were at one point first-time candidates, too. I'm curious, not to get ahead of yourself, but if you win, um, what do you see as the, the long-term plan? Do you plan to be in Albany for many decades? Do you think you can make a difference in a few years and then move on to something else? What do you think your life in politics will be, assuming you're successful in this first race? Uh, you know, Jared, I haven't looked past uh, Thursday night. Uh, it's been you know, very difficult to look past September 13th. Um, I do feel like uh, we're going to win. And honestly, if we were able to get up to Albany uh, and those housing renewal laws that I was talking about uh, earlier in the program, if we were able to pass some very progressive legislation there, um, to have some generational protection uh, for the folks not only in central Brooklyn but throughout the state of New York, I'd be a very happy camper. I could take my ball and go home uh, because it's the reason uh, that I won and uh, that, I, that I ran. And so um, I am uh, very much looking forward to seeing what the results are in September. 13th and really haven't thought much past that. Albany's the butt of so many jokes about corruption and incompetence. Those may or may not be fair, but in your heart of hearts, do you ever worry about becoming part of that, that, that you'll be tainted by that somehow, or that you'll get up there and realize you really can't get it get, get it done? You know, what's interesting is that I'm already starting to experience uh, this, uh, you know, guilt by association, right? When I'm at train stations and I'm handing out my literature, people say, well, all of you guys are the same. I'm not voting for you. I've never seen you. Um, you only come around during election time. Uh, and so I think there is just a natural association that people have, uh, not just with Albany, but with politicians in general. Um, I think part of what um, helps me and what has inspired folks um, is that I'm an idealist. I think that we are in a different time in this country. Um, I think we saw the election of the worst president of our lifetime, certainly, uh, in, in two, uh, two years ago. And I think that that has inspired a group of candidates, uh, and even the folks that are already in there, uh, to say we can't do things uh, the way that we've done them in the past. And so that really gives me hope um, that things might be different this time. So if you're elected, when you're elected, you'll be one of several officials in elective office in Brooklyn and obviously working with other officials as part of the game. Um, the borough president in Brooklyn, Eric Adams, has been a supporter of Senator Hamilton. How do you think the relationship between you two will be going forward given that background? Uh, you know, the, the truth is is that um, politics will be politics and campaigns will be campaigns, but then you have a responsibility to govern. Uh, and that responsibility uh, is not necessarily between me or whoever my perceived adversary is, uh, but it's really to the community. The community expects the people to be adults and to do what they have sent them there to do. So um, I'd be happy to work uh, with anyone that was on the other side of this race um, if that is for the betterment of the community. And I, and, you know, I think that um, it would be a detriment uh, for me not to do so. And I think the responsibility that I have um, as a leader in the community and as a state senator would be one to work with my colleagues to get what we need for our community. So we're very close to the election. Uh, obviously, the issues matter, the results matter, but also we need folks to run for office. And so I'm curious, since you are coming to the end of your first campaign, 
what did you like about running? What did you dislike? What surprised you? What do you take away from this regardless of the result on Thursday? Yeah, I think, you know, the best part about running, um, I just came from a senior center out in Sunset Park, uh, and being able to meet so many people that I wouldn't have otherwise been able to meet, being able to hear their stories, looking at the hope in their eyes for true leadership, people talking to me about their issues, um, that has been what has sustained me throughout this process. The worst part, and I have no bones about saying this, the worst part about running is having to raise money incessantly. Um, I think that uh, no one enjoys call time, no one enjoys having to pick up the phone and talking to your college buddy that you haven't spoken to in 10 years uh, to say, hey, I need you to donate to my campaign. Um, it's part of the motivation for um, why we need campaign finance reform, uh, but that is certainly my least favorite aspect of running, and anyone on my staff can tell you that. Well, Zellner Myrie, a candidate if on the Democratic side for the 20th Senate District uh, on Thursday's primary ballot. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. And now some news in collaboration with Brooklyner. At the top of the show, I spoke with an attorney about 911 survivors. In other 9-11 news, Borough President Eric Adams has called on the New York City Police Pension Fund to relax its rules on disability pension claims for NYPD personnel with 9-11 related illnesses. The amount of red tape and bureaucratic hurdles needed to make a claim have excluded claims made by those who need assistance after their roles on 9-11 and in post 9-11 cleanup, he said. Brooklyn City Councilmember Jumani Williams has secured the New York Times endorsement in his run for Lieutenant Governor, saying, quote, he can bring welcome change to Albany, end quote. More importantly, Williams has shared with AM New York what's in his ever-present backpack, including a bottle of cologne and a high-quality fidget spinner. And at the time of taping, Julia Salazar, candidate for state senate, had announced on Twitter that an article was about to be published that will out her as a survivor of sexual assault. She wrote that the article was actually intended to discredit her and others' accusations against David Keyes, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's spokesperson to foreign media. In other Salazar news, the good government group Citizens Union has withdrawn its backing of Salazar in the upcoming primary, saying she provided information about her academic credentials that proved to be incorrect. The group is now expressing, quote, no preference in this race with Martin Delon. A Clinton Hill mansion, which once served as a home for Civil War veterans and boasted an attractive red brick facade and mansard roof, has emerged from its makeover into a McMansion. And it's quite the sight. According to the designer, the client literally said, I want the White House. The White House it isn't. Yes, it has Corinthian columns, sort of, but the white is mostly surrounded by gray and glass, like a stocky office tower. Why was this atrocity allowed to happen? Because it's outside of the nearby Clinton Hill Historic District. Check out before and after images on Brownstoner. And finally this. At the state Supreme Court in Brooklyn, MMA fighter Michael Kisa filed a lawsuit over an incident that took place last April. Perhaps you'll remember, it involved former UFC lightweight champ Conor McGregor throwing a dolly into a window of a bus at Barclays Center at a loading dock, shattering glass and resulting in injuries to Kisa and others who had to back out of later fights. McGregor was named in the suit. To check out more on these and other stories, go to Brooklyner at BKLYNER.com. And that's the show for today. Tomorrow, Ashley's conversation with Brooklyn author and political commentator Anand Giridharis about his new book, Winners Take All.